My name is Marie Yeo, and I'm a teacher trainer at the Regional Language Center in Singapore. <clears throat> Please allow me a moment to introduce CMIL Regional Language Center. We are located in Singapore and we're part of the Southeast Asian Ministers of Education organization. Our mission is to develop language education in the region and promote international cooperation among language teachers. We do this in several ways, through publications. For example, we publish the SSCI indexed RELT journal, but mostly we teach English and train teachers. In fact, we offer scholarships for teachers from the ASEAN region to attend courses in Singapore, so I hope I'll see some of you in Singapore soon. As you can see from the pictures, before COVID-19, teachers from the Southeast Asian region would come to RELT to attend courses, sometimes for three weeks, sometimes for six weeks, and sometimes for even nine months. However, since the start of COVID-19, our teaching has gone from face to face to entirely online. So my life has gone from the pictures at the top to the one at the bottom. I'm sure many of you were or still are in the same situation. So my presentation today is about moving from face to face to blended and online teaching, how well we've been doing and how we can do better. First, I'll talk about COVID-19 and the rise of emergency remote teaching. <clears throat> I'll then describe how teachers and trainers carried out emergency remote teaching and the impact on our self-efficacy. Next, I'll argue strongly that we now need to move from emergency remote teaching to principled online practice. And finally, I'll um, explain to you some ideas about principal online practice, the SALMON five-stage model. So please sit back, relax, and let me start on my first point. What is emergency remote teaching? The term was popularized by Hodges and his colleagues in their article entitled, The Difference Between Emergency Remote Teaching and Online Learning. Let's take a moment to think about this, the difference between emergency remote teaching and online learning. So they say that emergency remote teaching or ERT is a temporary shift in instructional delivery to an alternate delivery mode due to crisis circumstances. They add it's what we're doing in a hurry with bare minimum resources and scant time. So if you note the words in red, temporary, crisis circumstances, in a hurry, bare minimum resources, this is probably what many of us were doing. This is probably what many of us experienced at the start of the pandemic. When COVID-19 hit us in early 2020, ministries of education around the region responded in different ways. In some countries, we had home-based learning, mainly using computers and tablets, like the picture in the top left of the very cute little girl. In some countries, lessons were delivered through the television or radio, as shown in the picture on the top right. In other countries, like in the bottom left picture, students were delivered study packages and teachers used mobile apps like WhatsApp, Line or Viber, to communicate with their students. And sadly, as the last picture shows, in some countries, schools were closed and students just stopped learning. All right, now that you have an idea of what emergency remote teaching is and how it's carried out, I have a question for you. Is ERT, emergency remote teaching, the same as online teaching? I'm going to launch a poll and you can choose your answers. 
So please launch the poll now. Thank you, thank you. So you can see from the answers, we've got about 22, 23% saying yes. We've got about half saying no, and we've got about 18%, 20% saying not sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll close the window now. Let's see. Let's look at what Hodges and his colleagues have to say. They say, well-planned online learning experiences are meaningfully different from courses offered in response to a crisis or disaster which is what COVID-19 was, a crisis, a disaster. So the answer to our earlier question is, not exactly. Emergency remote teaching is not the same as well-planned, effective online instruction. Let me now move to the second point. How did teachers carry out emergency remote teaching during the pandemic? And what was the impact on their self-efficacy? There is a lot in the literature about the experiences of teachers during ERT, but I would like to share the case of eight teacher trainers who attended a professional development course in Singapore in October 2020. So this was just six months after the start of the pandemic. Yes, this is a small number, only eight. But if you consider that these are the people who are responsible for training other teachers on how to teach online, I think it's really worthwhile finding out more about their experiences and perceptions. So please look at the WHO box. You can see that they were from these countries, two from Indonesia, two from Malaysia, two from Myanmar, one from Thailand and one from Vietnam, a really diverse group. Seven out of eight of them had to deliver emergency remote teaching during the pandemic. And for five out of seven, it was the first time that they were training teachers online. Now let's look at the green how box. I used a method of data collection called narrative frames. So I gave them sentence stems and they had to complete the sentence stems. So here are some examples of the sentence stems that I gave them. When I was told I had to teach online, I felt, and so they would complete the sentence. Some things that I liked, I didn't like about online teaching. Things that went well, things that didn't go well. So these were some examples. All right, so just to make our session more interactive, let's try to do one of these together. Please look at this sentence and write an adjective to describe your feeling. When I was told I had to teach online, I felt dot, dot, dot. And if you've never taught online, please write down how you think you would feel if you were told you had to teach online. Let's take 30 seconds to do this and I'll look at your answers in the chat box. Please go ahead. Thank you, thank you. I like shock. <laughs> Panic. Yeah, that was me too. Oh, unsupported. I'm so sorry to hear that. All right, you can keep your answers coming, but if you don't mind, I'm going to continue with the presentation so that I don't take up too much of your time. Thank you. So in the chat box, I saw lots of negative words. Um, I'm afraid I didn't see too many positive words. Let's see what the teacher trainers wrote. Here are their responses. It's interesting that the word excited occurred the most, followed by the word worried. Um, they reported slightly more negative words than positive words, which is the same as what you're reporting in the chat box. So thank you so much for your responses. So when I looked at the trainer's responses to other sentence stems, 
I could see that the responses were clustered into three areas. So first, let's look at the technology column. The trainers complain about the internet connection, no or unstable internet, having problems with the camera and microphone, and they also complain about the lack of functionality in their online platforms because many of them were using free versions of Zoom, so they could only have 40-minute sessions. They couldn't access the breakout rooms or polls. Let's now look at the middle column. The trainers also express competence about their own lack of competency. For example, they were unable to share the screen, to share the sound of videos. That still happens to me because I often forget. And they had difficulty organizing students into breakout rooms. Many of them didn't know how to use interactive student response systems like Kahoot or Mentimeter or Nearpod on top of Zoom. One trainer said that she didn't realize that she had to design slides differently for mobile learning, which is a very interesting thought because I don't think I've thought about that myself. So for those of you attending today on a mobile phone, I'm sorry if my slides are not too clear. Finally, let's look at the third column. This was about the teaching and learning environment. For example, being unable to give one-to-one -one feedback to a student during the lesson without the other students listening in. Whereas in class, we can just go up to the student and perhaps have a quiet word. There was also concern about um, very noisy, distracting learning environments for example, um, having to teach in a crowded staff room or students having to learn in very noisy places. So in response to these sentence stems, if I had the chance to teach the lesson again, I would. And I wish my institution had. Mm, I wonder what you would write. Well, this is what the trainer said. Nearly all the trainers said, number one, they wish they'd had more time to prepare. Number two, they wish they'd had better technology, for example, a good learning management system and paid subscriptions to apps. And number three, they wish they'd had more training in how to teach online and how to use different technology tools. I suspect that all of us had, and probably we still have, some of these wishes. To sum up, the experiences of teachers during emergency remote teaching are well captured in this thematic review. The title is Responses of the English Language Teaching Community to the COVID-19 Pandemic. So this article was based on a review of 55 research articles that were published since the start of the pandemic. It will be published in the December 2021 issue of the RELC journal, but it's available online. So I'm one of the editors of the journal and I asked Sage for permission to share this with you. If you scan this QR code or if you go to the RELC journal website, you'll be able to download the, few, the, the full article free of charge. So please take a minute if you would like to scan this, please go ahead and scan the QR code and enjoy the article. All right, let's look at the words in red. So the authors concluded that language teachers were generally inexperienced and ill-prepared. We struggled and this rapid change placed substantial stress on us. The last sentence about stress was especially true for me. I think probably some of you felt this too. If we all take a moment to think back to the early days of the pandemic during emergency remote teaching, I'm sure many of us were just surviving day to day. But thankfully, most of us now feel more comfortable teaching online, but I really wonder what was the cost to our physical and our mental health at that time? How did it affect us psychologically? So this brings me to my next point. 
how did emergency remote teaching affect teachers' sense of self-efficacy? So first, let's clarify what self-efficacy means. Shannon Moran and Hoy define it as a teacher's judgment of capability to bring about desired outcomes of student engagement and learning. So in simple words, it's a judgment about how well we as teachers can engage our students and help them to learn effectively. So there have been many studies on teacher self-efficacy during the pandemic, but please allow me to briefly share just three. In Presley and Haas study, so this involved about 250 teachers in the United States. These were the main findings. So number one, teaching online during the pandemic affected teacher efficacy scores in the areas of instructional strategies and student engagement. And number two, teacher self-efficacy was lowest for those who were delivering virtual instruction. In other words, teaching online compared to those who were delivering either hybrid or face-to-face -face lessons. Study number two by Ma and colleagues was in China and it involved 351 teachers. So these are the main findings. One, there was low online teacher self-efficacy at the start of their online teaching. Number two, Teacher self-efficacy for online instruction did not significantly increase from the start to the end of the pandemic in China. But here's the good news, everyone. Teacher self-efficacy for technology application had increased a lot. So this means that teachers felt they could use technology more effectively. Finally, the third study was carried out in Italy and it involved 251 teachers. The researchers found that one, there was lower self-esteem and self-efficacy during the pandemic teaching compared with previously during face-to-face -face teaching. And number two, that self-esteem and self-efficacy also decreased in teachers with greater service seniority. That means all the teachers like me, I wonder how the more senior teachers among us would feel about this. Do we agree with this finding? Mm. What about the teacher trainers in my case study? They completed a questionnaire based on a well-known sense of efficacy for online teaching questionnaire by Robinia and Anderson. They had to compare their sense of self-efficacy for 22 items. So they had to read each item and then they would say, am I better in face-to-face -face teaching? Is it the same? Or do I do this better online? So this is what they had to do for 22 items. Here are the things that more than half of them said they did better when teaching online. Number one, using technology like learning platforms and tools. Of course, we do this better online. Number two, fostering individual creativity and three, providing appropriate challenges for capable students, for very capable students. In other words, they were able to differentiate um, learning and stretch the really good learners. Here are some things that more than half of them said they did better in face-to-face -face teaching. So number one, let's think about it, getting through to disengaged students. Is this better online or face-to-face? -face? Number two, getting students to believe they could do well. Number three, improving the understanding of students who are failing. Number four, providing opportunities for collaboration. Number five, gauging students' comprehension. And number six, providing alternative explanations when students seem confused. Now, it's interesting to me that many of these involve weaker and less confident learners, which makes me think that face-to-face -face teaching might be more important for the weaker students, and perhaps online teaching might favor the, so the stronger students. In summary, to answer the question, 
how did emergency remote teaching affect teachers' sense of self-efficacy? The literature and my own study has found that at the start of emergency remote teaching, teachers and teacher trainers generally had lower self-esteem and self-efficacy, but the research also shows that teacher self-efficacy for technology application increased slightly over this period. Now, I think most of us would agree with this. Instead of being fearful like we were probably at the start of the pandemic, most of us can use technology tools more confidently and effectively. So let's take a moment to reflect. I'd like you to consider this question. What can you do better with technology now compared to at the start of the pandemic? Please type your answers in the chat box and I'll have a look at what you're saying. Please go ahead and do this now. Microsoft Teams, Microsoft Forms, absolutely. Video editing, me too. I can now edit videos because I have to. Zoom, 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 lots of zooms. Thank you. Keep your answers going and I'll continue with the presentation. And later at the end of the session, I'll be able to look at what you wrote in the chat box. Thank you so much for your answers. So everyone, let's take a moment. I think we really need to give ourselves a pat on the back because for many of us, we've become much better at using technology for our teaching. So congratulations, everybody. Well done. Right. Let me now move to the final part of my presentation. I'm watching my time here, Ivan. So in this part, I'll argue that we have moved out of the COVID-19 crisis mode. So now we need to move from emergency remote teaching to principal online practice. So I've heard teachers telling me about their experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic. And to be honest, it really makes me want to cry because many of the problems that you're describing are things that we've already addressed in the field of educational technology, in the field of computer assisted language learning in the past 20 years. So in publications such as these, you can see them, there's actually a lot of good advice and information about how to teach online. But I guess that at the start of the pandemic, when we were all so busy switching to online teachers, teaching, we didn't have time to look at the research. And because of this, many of us were reinventing the wheel and making mistakes. So I feel that this was okay at the start of the pandemic. We had the excuse to be in emergency remote teaching mode, but really now 18 months on, it is time for us to move to principal online practice. So what does principal online practice look like? If we look at pre-pandemic research from educational technology, and if we look at current research based on our collective experience since the start of the pandemic, we'll see many components of principal online practice. And today I'm gonna to focus on three components for effective online teaching. Number one, creating online communities. Number two, promoting cooperative and collaborative approaches. And number three, using appropriate pedagogical models for online teaching. All right, please take a moment to look at the slide. Let me introduce this model. It focuses on creating community and promoting cooperation and collaboration. It's called the SALMON five-stage model. It was developed by Jilly Salmon at the University of Queensland nearly 20 years ago. So stage one is called access and motivation. Stage two is called online team building. It used to be called online socialization. Stage three is called information exchange. Stage four is knowledge construction and stage five is development. So most language teachers like us, we're very familiar with stages three, four, and five, 
because it's very similar to our PPP approach, presentation, practice and production. So let's watch a very short one minute video, which explains stages one and two. Let's try to find out what stage one and two mean, and I'll explain later how we can apply it in an online lesson. Please sit back and enjoy. So stage one of the step, individuals will need access and purposeful reasons to take part. One key to stage one is ensuring that your participants have easy access to the platform, processes and systems in place. Another is that they are motivated to spend time and effort on their learning, not just once, not just twice, but they keep on returning throughout their unit of study. So then we move on to stage two. Stage two involves individuals establishing their personal identities with the learning group and then finding others to work and learn with. At this stage, as the designer, you are doing nothing less than creating your own little micro community through active and interactive learning and teaching. Be prepared to be amazed at how well your students can work together productively and constructively if you create the right opportunities and build the scaffold from the ground up. So this is how we can be prepared to be amazed. Um, here are some ideas about what we can do in a lesson for stages one and two. So to give students access and motivation and promote team building, even before we start teaching, we can do these things. We can send a welcome email with information about the course and ourselves. We can create short videos with instructions on how to use the technology, like how to log in, how to upload videos. We can do an online needs analysis using like Microsoft Forms or SurveyMonkey. And we can get students to write an introductory blog and upload photos of themselves. So in this way, we can actually get to know our students, they can get to know us, and they can get to know their classmates even before the lesson starts, the first lesson starts. And during the first lesson and subsequent lessons, we can do these things to build a classroom community. We can use icebreakers, energizers, and games. We can allow time for informal chat because in a face-to-face -face class, we often chat with our students during um, the break after the lesson. So we need to do this during online lessons too. Now for number three, I did this recently. I left my students in the Zoom breakout rooms uh, during the break. And when I um, visited the room, they were chatting and laughing. And finally, number four, we can assign in and out of class tasks and projects. So stages one and two are very important. And if you get this right, you'll be setting your students up for success. Now, let's sit back. We're gonna watch a two minute video explaining stages three, four, and five. And then I have a very short matching activity for you. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I think we still have time to do this. Plus it's really very important for you to know what the next three stages are. Please sit back and relax. At stage three, you can expect that learners will engage in mutual exchange of information and make their own course related contributions. At stage three, plan your design with a strong focus on learning outcomes, your pedagogical objectives, as well as the interaction between the group. At stage four in your design, it's possible to offer activities where group goals are there with more complex multiple activities and contributions. If you kept it simple to that point, you will find you're much happier about their ability at stage four. And you can design for your students to become contributors as well as consumers of knowledge. Now by stage five, you can expect that participants are comfortable in working together and can fully exploit the benefits of team working for their learning and the technology you've chosen to use. In your design, it's really worth trying to build in some suitable activities for this, the fifth stage. 
students should have become able to take more responsibility for themselves and their learning group. They can also look backwards towards what they've learnt through the first four stages. It's good design at stage five of your scaffold to prepare your students for some form of metacognition. By that I mean learning about how they are learning. Even one or two activities at this stage is really worthwhile for their future. Promoting metacognition enables a form of self-awareness and is an important part of becoming an independent learner. So activities at this stage should include reflection, evaluation and critiquing of the learning experience, not just the final exam. Right, so I don't think we have time for you to do this matching activity, so I'll just jump ahead and give you the answers. But this is how you could enact it in a real lesson. So for stage one, access and motivation, as I said earlier, we can send welcome emails, we can get them to write an introductory blog before the start of the course. And importantly, during the first lesson, we need to teach them how to use the tools that they'll be using online. For stage two, team building, you could do a getting to know you activity based on the introductory blogs. For stage three, you could give a PowerPoint presentation on your lesson topic with Q&A. For stage four, knowledge construction, you can get the students to work in groups to do a discussion based on your presentation. And finally, for stage five, you could get the groups to present. You could have a Kahoot quiz and maybe you can have some kind of exit card. So as I end my presentation, I'd like to share two important ideas about principal online practice for a COVID-19 endemic world. In other words, a world where new waves of COVID-19 may force us in and out of lockdowns and school closures. Firstly, as Hodges and colleagues say, we should not just return to our teaching and learning practices prior to the virus. Absolutely. Many of us have learned newer and better ways of teaching. We can use technology more effectively, so let's not abandon that and go back to the old ways. Secondly, as Morehouse and Conke wrote, we should remember lessons learned from our collective experiences and responses. In closing, I'd like to celebrate and affirm the efforts of language teachers and all teachers around the world. We've struggled, we've survived, and now we're beginning to thrive. So listen to these words of Winnie the Pooh. Dear teachers, promise me that you'll always remember you're braver than you believe, you're stronger than you seem, and you're smarter than you think. Thank you for your attention and please stay safe and well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for a wonderful presentation. If I could ask you all to show your appreciation in the chat uh, window by typing clap. Um, I think that was a fantastic Thank presentation you. indeed. We've got about 10 minutes for Q&A, so if you do have any questions, do pop them into the Q&A box as well, and we'll try to get through as many of the questions as we possibly can. I've noticed that a couple of questions have come in, um, and um, if, we, if I could ask you also to focus a little bit more on, on tertiary, on higher education, on university age students. If you do have any questions or thoughts um, or comments, um, we will also be sharing for everybody that has registered a link to the recordings. And the two presentations and panel discussion from yesterday were focused on secondary education and those from Thursday were focused on primary education. And I would strongly recommend that you check out our YouTube channel um, early next week to, to uh, have a look at those recordings. Um, in particular, some of the comments that Mary mentioned within the Salmon model, it, talking about tasks as well. The first presentation that we did yesterday was very much based on tasks and, and multimodal 
tasks and projects. And the second presentation from yesterday was based around building a community. And although the presentation was focused on building teacher communities, a lot of the comments about having members, supporters and leaders is also true if you build a community or try to foster a community within your students. So I strongly urge you also, related to Mary's presentation today, also go back and look at the other presentations that were related to that. But now, if I may, um, switch the focus back to uh, the spotlight back to, to you, Mary. Um, a fascinating presentation about the differences uh, between emergency remote teaching and principled um, online practice as well. Um, I think when we first started talking about the presentation as well, my, I, my, my comment was that whatever it is that you're doing, if you're teaching, there are some things that you do that, that you understand are great and you plan to do it again. And there are some things that you do and you realize they fail and you think I've either got to change what I do or I've got to stop doing that particular aspect. But there are many aspects of, of teaching that we just consider maybe are good enough. And I think that what you've proposed here is for us to, to, to reflect on everything. It may be good enough, but can it always be better? And I think one of the, the key points, one of the questions that's already come up in the Q&A is about the return to face-to-face -face teaching. You mentioned in your presentation a number of aspects that teachers found are much easier to deal with when they are teaching online. What do you think are the biggest challenges for teachers as they return to the classroom in terms of reverse culture shock? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... I think that, you know, we need to really start slowly because students who are uh, learning online, when they get back to the classroom, they're going to need the same kind of time to reconnect the, the socialization. So instead of online socialization, um, they're really craving human contact. So, you know, they'll want to socialize a lot more. And I think that both for educational gains and the students' mental health, it's good to include um, opportunities for them to really reconnect and not just jump in and focus on, I've got to achieve my lesson outcomes. I've lost so much time. I have to make up time. So, you know, maybe be gentle to yourselves and also be gentle to the students um, because we went through a kind of trauma and to some extent, the, you know, there'll be some reflection and there'll be some kind of post-traumatic stress disorder um, so really be really gentle to yourselves and don't just think we're just gonna go straight from online teaching back 100 percent full gear into face-to-face -face teaching uh, indeed i mean i, I no true word have been said i mean uh, your comments throughout your presentation was for teachers just to understand you know the the unbelievable work that you've all done over these past 18 months. I mean, I can't think of, of, of a more complex job to have to deal with under this environment where you're actually, you have all of your tools changed and you're expected to be able to cope with a new set of tools. And I mean, one of the things for me that I've often reflected on from, from the perspective of teaching is that it's not about you being able to cope with new tools, it's that you need to be able to use those tools to get your students, to get somebody else, to get a third party, to be able to do what you were previously able to do. It's not just about you, it's your impact on a whole load of other people. And I think that that's why, I mean, your, your words there for me, they, they really strike a chord, but there is a huge burden on the that, teacher. Though? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think Ivan, you really have a very important point you know, it's not about the technology, it's about the pedagogy. And I want to quote a principal from Indonesia who was recently in a course. He kept saying to me, it's not about perfection, it's about connection. Because I'd get so upset when the technology failed and, you know, I'd get so distressed and he kept saying, it's not about perfection, it's about connection. So, you know, if we put at the forefront pedagogy and connecting to our students and other stakeholders we're going to be absolutely fine english teachers around the world have really proven to be agile resilient creative and professional over this period so again you know i want to congratulate everyone here even today your professionalism of giving up your saturday morning to attend this it really is to be commended congratulations everyone Indeed, indeed. And, and as you say as well, I mean, that connection, that connection is also vitally important when you're bringing and welcoming students back into the class. Not only are you having to readjust 
the way in which you interact with students, but you're also going to have to help them readjust as well. And you're part of the guardians of, of their mental and emotional health as well as, as a teacher. I think that uh, the job of, of, of teachers is so, so critically important. Um, where, where do you think that teachers may have to focus a little bit more of their attention in that move back to the classroom? And, and if I can add on to that as well, when we talk about going back to the classroom, we may be talking about going back to a 100% physical classroom, or we may actually be talking about going back to a hybrid classroom where some students are physically present and some students are, are digitally joining via a, um, a computer screen. Um, what is your advice to, to teachers that find themselves in that situation? I think, you know, teachers, please reach out to communities. There are so many wonderful communities like the Cambridge community and other online communities. And, you know, learn from other people's experience. Don't suffer and go through trial and error. Because as I said, actually, we've been doing this online teaching for 20 years. There's so much in the literature. So, yes, I mean, for a lot of teachers, you don't have the time to read, um, you know, some of these very technical journal articles, but online blogs, uh, some of the online blogs are really very practical.